From Cleveland's doorstep, Lake Erie stretches out and covers 10,000 square miles. It's estimated that 3 million tons of assorted debris are dumped into Lake Erie each day. Experts say that if something isn't done, the lake could die in 10 to 15 years. In 1970, Lake Erie was in fact declared dead. Algal blooms generated by sewage and pollution from industrial waste had killed much of the lake's aquatic life. That same year, when the adjoining Cuyahoga River infamously caught fire, the so-called Dead Lake and the Burning River became poster children for the environmental movement that established the EPA and the Clean Water Act. I saw it as a beautiful lake as a little boy. Then in the 60s, I saw it turn into what was called the Dead Lake. And then I've seen it clean up to just a pristine, beautiful lake. Over the years, charter boat captain Rick Unger and those along Lake Erie's shores have witnessed the evolution of the lake. Its comeback after the Clean Water Act was widely celebrated. And by the 1980s, the most productive fishery of the Great Lakes was once again attracting tourists and fishermen alike. I grew up on this lake. My dad was a fisherman and he passed that tradition down to me. So I'd say I've been fishing on this lake for 52 or 53 years. We've seen this lake when it was bad and we're not just going to sit by and let it go bad again. We're going we're gonna to do everything we can to make sure this lake survives. By 2000, Lake Erie's pollution problems were thought to be a thing of the past. But recently, a new threat has emerged. This is Lake Erie in October in 2011, and the water is totally green with algae. Looks like we're actually driving through paint. I mean, it's so thick that is a lot of algae. The problem started coming back about 2000, 2002. It has accelerated. In the bloom that we saw in 2011, was two and a half times worse than any of the blooms that we saw back in the 1960s and the 70s. Dr. Jeff Reuter has been researching harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie for over 40 years. Lake Erie is the southernmost, the shallowest, the warmest of the Great Lakes. Uh, it receives the most nutrients, so biologically it's the most productive of the Great Lakes. But it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus found in sewage and fertilizer overfeed the algae and the lake, made warmer from climate change, provides a comfortable environment for the algae to thrive. Well, when you put nutrients into water, it responds very much the same way as putting fertilizers onto our lawn. It makes the grass grow. When we put nutrients into the lake in the summer, when it's very warm, would be when you would expect to get blue-greens or cyanobacteria, and they are capable of producing toxins that can harm people, harm animals. We've had the harmful algal bloom issue on Lake Erie since the 1960s. When we solved the problem the first time, the primary source of nutrients was poor sewage treatment. So we solved the problem by greatly improving sewage treatment. Today, the primary source is agricultural runoff. Phosphorus and, and the nutrients in general are coming from fertilizers applied to the land or manure from a, an animal operation. Corn, soybeans, and wheat are all users of phosphate, so we have to have it. If we would stop applying phosphate at all to our soils, it would be a real drag on our farm's ability to grow crops. We can get phosphate from different forms, but the most uh, popular form is dry fertilizer that we apply to our field. Today, farmers like Terry McClure are using a fraction of the phosphate that the agricultural industry used in the 1970s, but in the past several years, a mysterious, more potent form of phosphorus has been running off farm fields. On his fifth generation farm, McClure has added a new piece of equipment to determine the cause. What you see behind us the two collection systems for, for collecting the water that's coming off of this field. This self-automated sampling gear at the edge of Terry McClure's wheat field periodically samples surface and subsurface runoff. 
which partners at Ohio State University will test to determine precisely how much nutrient runoff the field is producing before it makes its way into the lake. The idea is to figure out how the dissolved reactive phosphorus is leaving the land by measuring at the edge of the field. That's the research that's never been done. We want to know what farming practices will tend to keep the phosphorus on the land. Agriculture is trying to be proactive, but it's really a, an all hands on deck issue. This is, this is everyone's issue. Although agricultural runoff bears the brunt of criticism, cities with their concrete, green lawns, and larger populations create their own perfect storm of nutrient runoff. Uh, during a storm event, many of our sewage treatment plants have what we call a combined sewer overflow, where the volume of water entering the plant exceeds the plant's capacity. And in those situations, the sewage literally enters the lake untreated with lots of nutrients attached to it. Throughout the city of Worcester, Ohio, scientists have devised a relatively simple solution to the city's runoff problem. I'm sitting here in a biphasic bioretention system, which is commonly called a rain garden. What it is is basically using nature's principles to help us clean the water. We have results that show 100% removal of nitrates and phosphates. Back on his boat, Rick Unger conducts water quality tests to support Dr. Reuter's research. Let's see what it looks like. It's perfectly clear. Today we've got a very clean lake. I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to be able to solve this problem within a few years. While the problem's not solved, the future looks bright.